All right, well, um, I'll get started here. I'll hit a couple of the, the roster moves from yesterday. I'll hit with some of the players with today's practice and, uh, and then get going from there. Uh, to start off, obviously, you guys saw the news with, uh, with Jake Butt. Um, you know, it's a, uh, always a tough decision for, for players, and for him, I think he handled it in a really good way. Uh, we had a good discussion, and it, it's an emotional time for him. It's difficult. It's not fun. It's not easy. But he's had a heck of a career, and so we respect him. And um, um, you know, just a, a really terrific kid. Um, as you saw, uh, Eddie Jackson with his hamstring, we placed him on the non-football -fo injury list, and Jermaine Fetty we placed on the physically uh, the PUP list. Uh, both of those, again, uh, for, for us right now, not not concerning. Um, I think that that's just kind of a part of the process, and and that's that with them. Tevin Jenkins for today's practice with the back tightness um, will not be out there. Uh, so again, we're just kind of working through that. And, um, and then uh, limited, again, is the same as you saw yesterday with uh, Robert Quinn and Bilal Nichols. Um, I think it's for us as players and coaches, uh, today marks a pretty cool time where the fans can come back to practice. You kind of feel the juice and the energy. Uh, it's not the 11,000 fans like, like we were getting at Bourbon A because of um, you know the uh, of the the new location, but at the same time, it's it's going to be a lot of fun seeing all those fans out there getting going. I know the players and coaches will will love it and we'll have a good time. So we appreciate those fans that showed up today. Yeah, it, it wasn't here. It wasn't here, um, but it was just just normal training. Nothing crazy, you know. Just. Uh, you know, just something that we want to make sure that we, we stay on top of and make sure that we're not forcing them back too soon. But it, it was not here. Coach, Justin is a confident kid. But when he has a bit of a, at least what seems like a bit of a rough day against the number one defense yesterday, how do you kind of prevent him from shying away from those intermediate to deep throws and choosing to check down and take the easier throw? All the time? Yeah, no, he is a really confident kid. And that's what we love about him. And he also knows how to handle um, adversity the right way. I mean, he's shown that uh, mentally and physically. Uh, you know, yesterday was kind of a little bit of a unique day of practice in the fact that it's all carded and you, you, we're telling you got to throw here, you got to throw there. So it's not really fair that way. Um, so we'll, we'll get back into things today. And, but he's, uh, he's a competitive kid, you know, and he wants, to, he wants to be great. He wants to do things the right way. And so um, that's what I love about him. Uh, didn't, didn't see Coach Flood out there yesterday. Any update with him? Yeah, so he's just uh, so coach is uh, he's fully vaccinated, but going through that co the COVID protocol, so that's why he wasn't there. Man, uh, despite all the focus on the quarterbacks, how much of this improvement you're looking for is just on the offense and the offense design, play calling? What specific areas do you want to get better, irrespective of the quarterbacks, to give Dalton and Fields a better chance to succeed? Yeah, I think all of it, Mark, for us is, um, you know, we can sit here and talk about players and how players, uh, we want to see improvement for them or build on their strengths. But it's the same thing for us as coaches, too. I feel like uh, offensively now heading into our fourth year, um, you know, we feel like right now the type of players that we have in this system and the fit that we have, the way we've kind of um, worked our, our, our scheme around the players, but also have had them understand what we want to do and what we feel like is, is, is a part of this offense and balancing both of that. When you throw the quarterback or the change of quarterback into that, that's a part of it. But um, for us, you know, we, we, you look back big picture and we just know we need to be more efficient, really when you keep it simple. We need to score more touchdowns. It, it can't be something where, um, you know, we're, we're statistically – um, you know, not putting up points. We got to be able to put put up more points and take the onus off the defense a little bit. So I think big picture, that's what's going to be fun in training camp. Is you got the one offense going against the one defense, the two offense going against the two defense. So it'll be a real gauge, and what better way to go up against our defense like we do every training camp? Matt, yes, you've gotten more familiar with Justin's skill set. You've seen him up close. What? strikes you about the ability to use him on designed runs and, and what that opens up for you potentially up the road obviously the the 4-4 four, four. I mean yeah, we, were, we were in a, a meeting um, in OTAs and it was funny because we were watching tape in, in the quarterback room and out of nowhere Andy just goes to Justin he says what's it like to, what's it feel like to run a 4-4 four, four? and I mean it's uh, not many people can do that at the quarterback position, but when you have design runs or you have uh, plays that break down and he can just make anybody on the field 
not catch them. That's a pretty good strength that he has that a lot of guys don't have. So uh, I say it jokingly, but at the same point in time, that's a huge weapon that he brings, and that's been a part of his game. But I don't think you see him overuse it. He just uses it when he needs to in college, you know, and it's it's uh, it's worked for him. Yes, can you use it more in design settings in terms of in the red zone, short yardage, those type of things? I just think in, in general, um, again, that's probably – working more towards all these quarterback strengths, whatever they are. And, and when you have a guy that can do that, you know, you want to be able to um, do everything you can to work around what their strengths are. So that would be one for sure. Man, yesterday yes. we talked to Robert Quinn, and he seemed pretty determined to put last season behind him, was pretty honest about how it wasn't a great year for him. How much of doing that will be uh, about making his fit within the defense a little bit better? Sure. I, I think that that's um, – Real at the same time, what you find, and you probably saw it yesterday or felt it with these these players, is um, there's a lot of self accountability from these guys. Like they're they're frustrated too with how the way things went last year, and they're they're not making excuses. They're just saying, you know what, um, I need to play better, and it's the same thing for us. I need to coach better, and we if we do that, we'll be better in, in general. So. Um, Robert is a guy that has played in this league for a long time, and he's had a lot of good uh, seasons where he's, I mean, times to where he's led the NFL in sacks, and he has his way of doing things. And so I think that's where you're going to see Coach Desai uh, really try to use Robert in the way that Robert's used to being used. And then he also has to understand what we want to do schematically. So it's just kind of letting him go play and then having Robert and Khalil on one side and the other side and moving guys around, I think, is is advantage bears. And, and they're motivated to go out and be more productive this year. Matt, when you guys drafted David Montgomery, you had this projection of what he could be as a runner and receiver. Has he, with the, with the instability and inconsistency on the line and that quarterback, has he gotten the opportunity to be what you imagined him to be? Yeah, I mean, I think he has, and, and he understands, too, there's growing pains, just not with the O-line and the quarterback and, and the offense in general, but himself. And I think his expectations and standards his first year um, were, were really high, and when he didn't hit those, he had to learn how to reset for the next year. But what he's done is, and I think you guys would all agree here, is that he's improved every year. He's gotten better. I know we know as a leader, um, with the way he's in that huddle and the way he – how coachable he is. So another guy that's so motivated to, to just go out there and does not care. I think this is what's special about him is he doesn't worry about things that, that are out of his control. He just wants to be, when you give him the football or when you tell him to run a route, he wants to be perfect with that. And I think you're going to probably see a little bit of that this year from him and uh, that now that we're kind of finding our, our mode with the, the O-line and, and the scheme and what we want to do, uh, he's probably going to feel and look a little bit more comfortable out there. Matt, you talked about how uh, Cole's role is going to increase. Mm -hmm. What was the offseason like for you schematically, just looking at different ways to use him? And how different was that than last year when, number one, you didn't know you had him until the draft, and, and then maybe you weren't quite as sure what you had? Yeah, uh, c watching him come out of Notre Dame and seeing the size that he had and the strength that he had. Um, now it was mentally coming into training camp and how much could he handle, uh, not just in the pass game, but in the run game as well. Uh, so once we got to the middle of the season and you guys saw those last five or six, seven games, uh, when, when he started getting more targets, it just really proved to us and he proved to us who he is and what he can be. Um, so when you have that, now you head into year two and it really, you know, you know what he, what routes he can run well, and what routes maybe he needs to work more at. And you know, Cole and I have gotten together and in the passing game, and we've we've talked through and watched um, a lot of clips of how to run specific routes. That I wasn't able to do that in training camp last year with him. Now in OTAs, I mean, he come up to my office and we'll watch we'll watch some routes, and then we'll put it into fruition in OTAs. Now he gets to do it in training camp. So I think you'll see him keep growing. And our relationship is building in, in the trust of how we work with each other. And you with these Kelsey maps? <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> you mentioned a few times lessons you've learned and things you have to get better at. Did, did last year kind of elicit a moment of introspection for yourself, of looking at your own role and what's going on here, just more attuned to that? For sure, yeah, without a doubt. I, I um, you know, we talk about the players being competitive. I'm, I'm, you know, my family will tell you I'm, 
probably more competitive than most people. And when you go through a year that we went through last year, um, in a lot of ways, you lose six games. That, that's a that's a struggle. That's hard. And um, we all want to be the the best uh, team in the NFL. We want to ha we have the best city of fans that support us. But when you go through that, it's hard. And and so you're able to reflect and you get away from the season. Um, you think, where can you get better? How can I be a better coach? And um, and I take that very seriously. So it's um, you know it, it, it's humbling. There's humility involved in that. You got to be open with your players. You got to show them that you're not perfect. That you can be better. And and now you get another chance to to do it together. So um, just as much as they're motivated, trust me, I'm motivated too. And uh, I look forward to it. As a first time head coach, how difficult was it to come to that moment? Because there's so many avenues to kind of blame. You know to blame what's going wrong on something else that you probably don't just yeah. you probably don't want to think of yourself. Well, I rely a lot on my, my peers. I rely a lot on my mentors. Um, I talk to a lot of different um, people, not not just leaders in this in this profession, but in other professions. And, um, you know, it's it's nice to, to listen to stories from other people that in similar roles that have gone through similar situations and circumstances and how to handle it. And, you know, um, if, if you can't go through these failures and and accept where you can get better you, you won't you won't succeed and you'll 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 be gone and so um i i look forward to really just trying to now not talk about it but show it and do it and in all phases and and you know for me it's just it just it feels easier being my fourth year now i know where where i struggled i know where i've been stronger at things and so now i get a fresh clean slate to get in there and try to do it and and there's just, you know, from Monday to Sunday, there's a lot of different areas. And, and I just, I accept that and, and I look forward to it. Yeah, to that end, to that end when, as you target growth as a play caller, what do mm -hmm. you want to get better at in that department? Well, you know, that's a, another unique um, topic. And, and for me, uh, when, you, when you struggle like we did last year and you go through that funk, uh, again, you've heard me say it a million times, it, it's not fair if I just, look at the players and say, ah, the players aren't doing what we're supposed to do. It's not to play calls, et cetera. And we were in a funk and, and it needed to be done. At the same point in time, I do have a lot of belief and confidence in myself and in the way that I've learned um, when to call plays in certain times, um, personnel-wise, formations, motion shifts, all that stuff. And then even schematically, relying and trusting on your coaches that are there in between the series of plays in the game. I think we've, we got – I told you that last year. We, all, we got better in communicating on the sideline in between series, uh, which, which has helped all of us out. So now this year, I need to be able to, to do that, use that, and then communicate with the quarterbacks and make sure we're all feeling the same – you know, or seeing the same stuff. And um, is every play going to be the perfect play call? No. I mean, that's not going to happen. And there's times where I tell the players, listen, there's going to be a bad play call. you got to bail – the play call out, the play caller out, right? Um, but at the same time, hopefully, we, as coaches, we can make a good play call and make it like, hey, here comes cover two. You know, you're throwing a reverse nod right down the middle, and we hit it, and there's nothing better than that when that happens. Now, what's your level of curiosity with this receiving group, and in particular with the newcomers that you brought in, the veterans, and how much different will this group look beyond Darnell and Allen? Yeah, I, I would say this. Um, you're probably specifically talking about Marquise and, and Demir off the top, right? Um, two guys that number one, uh, they're they're they've been in this league a little while. Marquise has been in it for a long time, and he's been in some good systems. Um, they came in here willing to learn and do everything that we asked them to do. I mean, it's it's been really cool to see them not just do that selfishly for themselves, but they've been great teaching these other receivers that we have and trying to help them out and, and show them what it's like to practice. And, um, and really, like in the meetings, they're locked in. Uh, they want to be great. So the speed element's real, right? They bring a lot of that speed. Um, but don't get it wrong. Like people like to say that Marquise is a track guy that plays football. That couldn't be more opposite of what, what he is. Uh, he's a phenomenal route runner with great hands. And uh, I'm excited to see him go, along with Demir. So you match those guys up. We got other guys on the roster, Ridley and Wims. Uh, I thought Ridley really put together a great OTAs. Uh, was excited to see him do that. And now a lot of these guys, when you get to this wide receiver position, right, 
this is where a lot of these guys, that fourth, fifth, sixth guy, they got to shine in special teams. So that's going to be my challenge and Coach Tabor's challenge to these guys is that that fifth spot is going to be real with special teams. Yeah, the play calling stuff, uh, you've explained, you know, why you're going back. But I'm curious about your evaluation on that um, in, in terms of how it impacted you as a head coach and a game manager when you weren't calling plays, and how is it different when you are and when you aren't? Yeah, it, it is a lot different, um, and that's a that's a real question in the fact that I didn't know really <clears throat> since I was a head coach how that was going to go, but you have to be able to just step back and now – and and you are able, you are able to see more of the big picture of situation situational stuff, right? Um, there's there can be times where I'm over on the on the bench talking about a play that just occurred with the offense while the defense is up, and I got to rely in those situations on the coaches up in the booth to chime in and get on the headset to me real quick to get over there and and check this out or check that out. The challenges are the ones where you got to be smart with that. Um, so for the most part, I would say it is different, but at the same time, um, I don't feel like when, I, when I'm calling plays, I, I still feel like uh, because of the communication on the sidelines with the other coaches, I'm able to still be the head coach while the defense is up there. And I, I really didn't think it was, um, you know, I think both, both ways are doable, uh, but it's certainly a little bit different. Time for one or two more. Do you have uh, any kind of update on the percentage of your roster that's vaccinated now? And did you have any guys come in when they got here the other day and get vaccinated? Yeah, we, we did have a couple um, that a couple guys that uh, showed up that ended up getting vaccinated or, or told us we're in the process. Uh, and again, I know that 85% number is thrown out. I don't know if that's a locked number or not, but I can say that we're, we're either at or above that. I feel really good about that. So um, that's really kind of the update where we're at there. And that number just the, the, we know who the guys are that are not fully vaccinated, which helps us out. And that number keeps getting smaller and smaller. Coach, I know you, you mentioned a little last bit one. about the excitement of the fans being here. It's been a long time. Yeah. That energy around this team is so big. Can you just kind of expound a little bit more about what it means to have them here, kind of bring them to training camp? Yeah, well, they, they this game that we play, and we all got to taste it last year, is um, it's a fun game, but it's not the same without fans. And it's just, it's just not. That's real. And so when we have the fans show up to games, when you have the fans show up to practices, when everybody's out there, um, that's what this is all about. I mean, they – they make this game, and, and so um, to, to have the city of Chicago and all the fans that come from everywhere to come back and just kind of feel like we're a little bit back to normal here, and I'm sure they'll be chanting, and there'll be, you know, and there'll be hecklers out there, which there always is at training camp, you know, uh, but we'll have a good time, and I think we put together a good plan for the players to also appreciate and understand what we didn't have last year. So now when everyone's out there at practice, we'll have a little fun. You know, we don't have to be super uptight all the time. And that's what it's all about. So, um, you know, we always wish everybody could come. We know the numbers are tight, but at the same time, it's going to be cool with the fans that are out there, and we appreciate it.